Today, I'll be talking with Chris Klasowski. He's the president of Easy Digital Downloads. That means if you're looking to sell any digital product on your WordPress website, then EDD is the perfect solution for you. And with over 10 years of experience selling his own digital products, as well as watching over 50,000 website owners sell digital products for their business, he is here to share five tips to start selling digital downloads on your site right now. And for me, I was really moved by number five, tip number five. So when you hear that one, let me know what you think about it as well. So let's dive in. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for being here and chatting with us about digital download purchases and selling. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to talk about this. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could just do a quick rundown and tell us a little bit about Easy Digital Downloads and how you actually became involved with it. That's like a decade in the making, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, I mean, Easy Digital Downloads itself is uh, the the best way to sell digital products with WordPress. Um, it really focuses and hinges around digital creators uh, as the customer. So, uh, my background with it, uh, I, I'm by trade a software developer. Uh, I started cutting my teeth early in my early years working on WordPress solutions at uh, in the hosting industry. So uh, from there, took that knowledge I gained and started working with Easy Digital Downloads as a user. To start with, I had a couple of WordPress plugins and uh, wanted to find a way to monetize some stuff. And uh, about two months after it was released, back in 2012 is when I started using it. Uh, and then from there, got involved with the project by helping out and support here and there, just kind of as a, as a weekend project. Um, Later became you know, a code contributor as I found bugs and wanted to help out there. And about in 2015, I uh, joined the team full time as a lead developer. Uh, and then about that, like six years later, here we are. Uh, I'm the president of Easy Digital Downloads now. Um, I lead all aspects of the team. I handle the support team and, and development team and marketing team. I kind of guide them in the direction. And uh, at this point, I'm just excited to show up every day and, and keep building uh, are a project for, you know, 50,000 store owners. Yeah. So the great thing about your history and all of the experience that you have is you've seen so many businesses building up their digital products and, and things like that. And I was wondering, you could probably pull these together in some tips. And I was wondering if you could share maybe your five tips for selling digital products, uh, with over, with all the experience that you've seen and had. Yeah. I, I mean, I have a huge sample size of data to work with. So, um, I guess the first one that I see uh, that, that I usually tell people is that it's all about the product first. Uh, you know, customers and, and visitors come to your site for one reason, and that's because your product solves a problem for them. Um, it's really easy to get wrapped up as you're kind of working into the e-commerce and digital uh, digital e-commerce uh, uh, journey to get wrapped up in the like how to sell your product, the web building the website and doing all the fine tuning of that. But th at the end of the day, um, your product is what, what customers are looking for because it solves a problem for them. Uh, and I, I feel like when it's really easy to lose sight of, of the why we're building it and we end up really kind of focusing on the how to sell it. And then when we do that, you know, we, we end up not really meeting a customer's expectations at, at the post purchase process. So, uh, I usually guide people to kind of define who you're selling to who's whose problem are you solving and i i like to write these out in sentences i like to define a customer and think about that customer whenever i'm making decisions because you really want to be a solution to their problem you don't want to be a solution in search of a problem um finding finding a solution in search of a problem while it can be successful there's a lot more risk to it whereas if you find a problem and build a solution to it, uh, you have a built-in a built-in customer base for that. Because if you have the problem, someone else likely has the problem. Um, so I usually write out who needs my product, and and I always keep that in mind when I'm building things, uh, building features, fixing bugs, things like that. Uh, and kind of once you have the who you're selling to, I really find it helpful to kind of set out some missions for your product. Like, well, what's your what's your mission statement? Uh, I know that's kind of a a weird thing to think about for a product perspective, but it's all about you know, what problem are you specifically trying to solve? Who's it for? What are you trying to solve for them? And then I try and come up with a small list of like the, how we solve that problem. Um, for instance, you know, we're an e-commerce store for digital creators. One of the things we really want to make easy is managing your store and scaling your business. Those are two, two things that we really want to do. Uh, so how do we build our product in a way that, um, 
allows people to manage their store easily and doesn't um, become a problem when they start to grow and if they grow quickly. So uh, a lot of times as we're as we're deciding what features as, as business owners, as product builders, when we get a new feature request, when we come up with a new feature, you know, having our morning cup of coffee, it's nice to kind of use those those five, you know, roughly five things that you can say, does this help me achieve this goal for the customer? And if it doesn't meet that, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means it maybe shouldn't take focus on your roadmap. And so when they have created the product or they have a good idea now, um, what would be your tip, like the next tip of once they have this, this idea that they're going to sell and it's a pretty good idea. So what would be like the next tip for them? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Cause then there's, there's so many directions you can go. I, I think that's the beauty of creating products and, and, and marketing them is that you've really got, you know, five directions you could go in at once, but it's really good to stay focused. So once your product's built and you're ready to sell it, ready to get it out there and distribute it to customers, um, keep in mind, I guess, tip number two would be keep in mind that people buy solutions, not features. You know, we talked about solutions in the first tip. Um, when you're building your marketing site, when you're writing your emails, when you're um, putting out your tweets and your Facebook posts, if you sell features, people can't imagine how the product will help them. But if you sell a solution to a problem, it's easier for them to be in the mindset of this is the product that will make my life easier. At the end of the day, everyone's trying to buy back time. We, we buy we buy software, we buy things so we can negate effort on our end, especially in, in, in the e-commerce game, the software game. So you have to really focus in on the, this is how our product solves your problem, not my product has all these fancy features. Um, and I think the other part of by, by selling the solution is it really sets up a better uh, expectation um, post-purchase because they now see what your solutions are and how to solve them instead of just a collection of things that they can't imagine how it's going to make their life easier. Yeah. So I have a big smile on my face simply because just last week I went through this and it was a digital product that somebody was selling. It's a solution that I'm looking for. Uh, I come on this landing page and the solution is an e-course. Uh, and the number one bullet tip was um, uh, like 25 hours of high definition video. And that was not what I'm looking for. That's, that's I don't even know if that's even a feature that the product was solving. It was just a feature of, of the delivery. So um, I really resonate with what you're saying about tip number two, make sure that you're um, showcasing the solutions that you're going to solve for the customer, because that's what we're looking for when we're looking on the landing page. Absolutely. Yep. So very cool. So, but she did have a landing, you know, they did have a landing page and um, kind of getting into that what are some of the other ideas that say they do have a landing page and they're, they're solving the problems. They're showing me what I can purchase. Um, what's maybe another tip that they can have in, in order to improve that process. Yeah. I mean, getting, getting someone to your site is like that first step, you know, they get to your site, you landed them, you got them here. Now you need to keep them. And it's all about your purchase funnels. How do we get per the person from the, the visitor from the, the site, the page they landed on, to viewing your pricing, to getting to the checkout, to completing the purchase. And our goal should be to do that uh, very intentful. Um, I think if you focus on channeling your customers, <clears throat> and in our experience, it, it, it's the same way and, and the customers I've spoken with, when you can channel your customers through as few funnels as possible, um, it, it really helps you as a business owner understand <clears throat> your customer's journey to the purchase. Uh, when you have a hundred pages and all of them can lead to checkout, it's really hard for you to understand and for the customer to understand how to get where they want to go. Um, but when you funnel everyone through, uh, you know, this is really easy for single product sites. You know, you sell one product, it's really easy to build a pricing page uh, that explains clearly all of your, um, all of your features, all of your plans, everything, all, all the all the, all the benefits to look at. However, if you have a hundred products and you don't have some sort of funnel um, or or a minimal set of funnels, it will create a, a really a really hard challenge to kind of understand that journey. So my my tip for for number three is just be intentful with how you navigate people from their first visit to your site to the checkout page, and, and do that in as few ways as possible. Um, it's always about least clicks. You know, you don't want people jumping around as few clicks as possible. Um, 
and, and ensure that those funnels have all the information necessary to really, again, drive home the fact that you're the solution to the problem that they're having. That's cool. But how do we, how do we know that we're doing it in as few clicks as possible? Yeah. And that, that's a great segue into our number four tip, which is awesome, which is you, you cannot improve, but you cannot measure. Um, this is something that, you know, I, I love to, to work, uh, to, to use in, in any time I want to make it a big change. Um, as we're growing, uh, especially in the early phases, when you don't have a lot of data from, you know, uh, visitors, from traffic, from uh, users, it's really easy um, because as, as we build a product, we become the expert of the product. Like that's kind of the, the catch 22 is to build a product, you have to f become fairly familiar and intimate with the product's market. And therefore you become kind of a subject matter expert on the product or the, the market you're in. But it's really easy to get caught into the, uh, the instinct of, of what to do next. So I always encourage people to use data to make decisions. Um, I, I really uh, am, am uh, keen to identify when my brain starts with, I think, when I'm about to make a change. Because if I think, it means that I don't have the data to make the decision that it's the right choice. So. Whenever I start a phrase with, well, I think this would be a great feature, I have to take a step back and then figure out, well, how can I determine if this is a good feature? How can I determine if this is a good change? Um, that's really the key to making sure that anything you do is effective, uh, that your funnels are, this is great for funnels because you can test button colors, button shapes, lists, text size, um, you really focus on finding something you can measure. And before you make the change, it's really good to have a baseline. So. Uh, you may want to get that cool new, uh, you know, pricing button color change out today. But if you don't have data that shows how your current button color is 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 uh, converting, then any change you make, really, you have no idea if it did improve or not. Um, so it's it's a good idea to always make sure you have a sample set of the control, if we put it that way first, and then run your experiment. I do this a lot with A-B testing and we encourage people, uh, you know, as they grow their business to use A-B testing and heat map tools, um, heat map tools, Microsoft Clarity, Hotjar, things like that. Um, so A-B testing helps us understand human behavior by showing uh, a user uh, the control or the experiment. And that's usually something they continue to see until their session expires. And then we get a good idea of if that change affected people in the right way. Uh, the heat map tool is a great way to understand how people are using your site. You know, you may have a feeling that people read in a certain pattern, but as soon as you watch a heat map of how people read your site content, you realize that people read in really strange ways sometimes, or they click on things that, that you might be like, why would anyone click on that? But you'll realize, oh, why are they clicking on that? And if it's not a button, that's taking their attention away from something else. So we maybe we shouldn't make that look like it's clickable. Um, and once we have some data on how the site's being used and everything, we can then come up with our A-B tests and uh, uh, execute on some, on some experiments, as, as they're called, and then make our decision on if our change was helpful or not. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, I will say that seems um, like further on, say I'm new and I'm just getting started, and I'm starting to think about mm -hmm. all of these things, and I'll, I'll probably start to get a little nervous about um, the next step. So like... Are there any tips on how to just get started? Uh, analytics. Get Google Analytics installed immediately. Um, that's like the, the quintessential first thing you do is get Google Analytics installed. There's some sort of analytics. We, I, I prefer Google Analytics just because I know how to use it. Um, there are a lot of analytics tools out there. Um, I know All-in-One SEO is what we use. Um, it actually has built-in heat map uh, with Microsoft Clarity. Um, and then... As soon as you have analytics installed, you'll really kind of get a picture using some filters. Uh, I like to use the acquisition tool to see how I'm getting my users, where I'm getting them from. Uh, is it from referrals? Is it organic search? Um, and then I like to use it for identifying and watching my e-commerce conversion rate. So if you don't want to get all the way into A-B testing um, yet, you can still identify with uh, with uh, Monster Insights for um, Google Analytics to see with the e-commerce add-on, see what your conversion rate is, like how often are you converting users? Uh, and then you can, without A-B testing, see if your changes are, are, are effective. Um, 
the, the really interesting part about early on is if you build traction quickly, uh, it may be unclear if your changes are working or if you're just building an audience really quickly. So sometimes that's difficult to identify, um, but if you can kind of use the filters in Google Analytics to identify if these are social traffic or organic traffic, um, you can easily quickly see what channels are converting for you with e-commerce tools, the e-commerce uh, data inside Google Analytics. I think the biggest one, and this is something I have have had happen to me, and I think everyone who builds a product and, and releases it and updates it is um, sometimes it's scary to publish. Uh, you know, I say publish because I work in the WordPress space and, and everything is publishing when it goes live. But sometimes it's, it's hard to hit the button to make something live, uh, whether it's an update or a new product. Um, there's as confident as we can be in ourselves, in our product, in our teams, there's always that what if in the back of our brain that, that sits there. Some people have the ability to shut it off. Some people don't. Um, I think it's a healthy fear uh, to have that a little bit because it, it makes us it makes us better by uh, as long as we can control it and not let it control us. It lets us kind of think about all the possible uh, outcomes. So we we do. Um, I like to use lists. I build a lot of checklists. Uh, I use Google Docs and checklists a lot. So these checklists will contain a, a, a must-haves, so a set of things that we have to do before this release goes live um, or an update goes live, a set of nice-to-haves, so not necessary to have. Um, if we have the time to do it, it'd be great, but they can also be kicked to a, a fast follow. Um, and then the last one is a... Is a, is a um, kind of potential challenges. I don't want to call them failure points because uh, that's putting a negative spin on it, but there's potential challenges. And the reason I like to write these out is because we, as our brains try and think of all the bad outcomes, I have a tendency sometimes to go down the non-happy path uh, of, of results. We tend to over um, make things over dramatic in our brain uh, and Sometimes writing them out ahead of time lets me say, all right, well, what if this happens? Well, okay, well, if that happens, I just change, I just run a database query and everything's fixed. Or I can just roll it back. And if I do it within five minutes, hardly anyone will get the update and we can release a follow up. Uh, it's good to do that because then you write these things out. You get them on, on paper or, or paper because it's, it's digital. Um, and then as you're going through your process, these, this potential challenges list. Uh, if you run into a problem during the release or during the update or, or during the execution of your, of your mission, you kind of have what you're supposed to do as soon as something goes wrong. Uh, it's a, I, I, when we were doing the EDD 3.0 release, a great example is I, I talked to the team and I think I think I stole this quote from um, from Apollo 13 and the and Gene Kranz. And it's that uh, we, we don't want to make things worse by guessing. We work the problem. We don't, we don't guess. Um, and I'm paraphrasing that, but that was, you know, as we were pushing our biggest update in 10 years live, it was all about don't guess, get the data, have the solutions. Here's our list of potential challenges. Here's how to fix them. And we move forward. Um, the, the nice to have list and, and the must have list is great. Um, a lot of people focus on optimizing checkout, optimizing purchase funnels, optimizing the account area all before they release something. And, and the reality is that's just slowing down your growth potential. You know, we, we like to talk about compounding. If you get a user today and you, you release today, but you wait two weeks to release your website uh, and then get your first new customer that you've two weeks of potential of not getting new customers. So I always like to say those are iterable. You know, you can iterate on your landing page. You can iterate on your account area. Your product needs to go live now. That's probably one of my favorite tips of all of these. I'll be honest, because so many of our audience, we um, there are a lot of them are beginners and they they get stuck in that. I'm going to do everything, make sure my font looks best, make sure I have the best theme on my site. And they're really just um, ways to keep themselves from moving forward and hitting publish and, and making their site go live. So I don't know, maybe maybe we can talk you into coming back and we can go deeper on that um, in a future one, because that's just such a big part of 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 this whole thing is if they don't hit publish, then. They're not even going to exactly, have so exactly. It's all a time game, you know. And, and like to be clear, I, I'm not saying that purchase funnels and checkouts and account areas aren't important. They are super important to your customer. Um, but like we we lose focus 
or maybe it's not losing focus, but that, that little thing in the back of our head says, well, if I just tweak this thing on the site, if I just tweak that thing, I'll push it live tomorrow. And then another thing comes up. There's always something that's the nature, especially of, of, since we're in software, but that's the nature of all product businesses. There's always something that we could be doing next, but until we push the first one live, we're not really moving our business forward. So it's all about hit publish get it out there, start gaining traffic, tell the world about your product. And the real, the, the cool part is, is once you start getting users, customers, um, if there's a problem, they'll tell you. It may be that what you've done is, is good enough for the customer base you have that they won't even know that you wanted to change the font size to 10 pixels instead of 12 or whatever. Like they won't notice that if your product is good because they're there for the solution to the problem, not to interact with your website post-purchase. There's been a lot of talk recently. I'm just going to want to get a little more history about EDD because I want to know how is it different than using, say, a third party marketplace like Gumroad? And the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because there's been a lot of changes in third party marketplaces like Gumroad. They're increasing their fees. You even have um, Shopify that mm -hmm. just increases their fees. And so how is ED different than these other third party marketplaces or e-commerce platforms? You know, in 10 years, I've watched the e-commerce world completely uh, blow up. It's been crazy. Uh, you know, when we started with Easy Digital Downloads, there weren't that many um, SaaS based, you know, software as a service based solutions to e commerce. It was pretty much all self hosted. You know, you had a few Drupal carts, you had a few PHP based carts, you had, uh, you know, a couple WordPress shopping carts. And, and then there was a bunch of other platforms that, you know, there was some Microsoft, C Sharp, whatever. There was a lot of them, but they were all self hosted. You know, there weren't that many like, um, SaaS based solutions. Uh, then SaaS became the thing that everyone was building SaaS uh, products and, and e-commerce jumped into that, which was a smart move because I think there's a section of the market that doesn't want to host their own site that doesn't want to, um, you know, deal with that aspect of it. They just want to be able to sell some stuff. Um, and, and that market is, is I think a very viable market, but what we don't realize is that those costs come in different ways, you know, there's, it's not just a monthly fee. There's always these little tiny, um, there's always these tiny little percentage fees that come along with it because they're trying to keep prices lower on a monthly basis. You know, they're thinking about monthly churn and, and we're focused on um, yearly. So we keep customers for a year uh, is what our license links are. So easy to download is really different because we don't really penalize you for being successful is how I like to put it. Um, you know, you aren't limited by the number of products you can create. Uh, you can create as many as you want. You not, limited by how many customers you can sell to, how many tractions, transactions you can get in a month. Uh, and we don't really have like relisting fees or we don't charge you to create a product. Um, you know, with, with other e-commerce platforms, you may not pay as much up front. So, you know, you may pay $29 a month or $19 a month, but as you start to use the services and, and it's not all of them, I'm, I'm making a generalization, but there's a lot of little fees that tack on here and there, you know, that take an extra five or 10% of each transaction. And those start to add up. And especially when you have a great month, uh, you know, Black Friday month is a great example of when some of those services can become extremely um, cost uh, inefficient to a store owner because if they run a great sale, all of a sudden, you know, 10% of, you know, double their revenue is a lot of money going out the door. Um, so I think the, the other advantage is that you own your content. Uh, when you sell on a third party service, whether it's a, a SaaS based solution or an integration where the data goes off to another server, um, that data is not yours. I mean, a lot of them allow exports and things like that, but at the end of the day, it's living on their server that, you're kind of renting from them. And, and when you run it in your own WordPress site, you, tomorrow you could decide that you want to shift to a new website and you can just migrate that data over. It's yours. You want to change the domain name. It's yours. The license keys are all in your database. Um, the purchase data is and customer information is in your database, not someone else's database. Um, so I think, and it also integrates seamlessly with WordPress. Uh, which in my mind is a massive, massive benefit because we, you know, 60,000 plugins available in, the WordPress repo, like the sky's the limit, what you can achieve with your store. Uh, so if Easy Digital Downloads is there and you find that you need another feature from another plugin, you can just install it on WordPress and be done. You don't have to go pay, you know, typically don't have to go pay another, you know, Shopify add-on or something like that. Yeah, that's something uh, that's pretty amazing and how it's different. And going a little bit back to your tip number one about creating a product 
could you give just a little bit of advice on how, what's the best approach in pricing and say packaging a product so that people can maximize their revenue? Oh yeah. We've, we've been through this on, on our own site. You know, this is, you could, you could spend hours and hours trying to come up with the best offering for your store. And I think it comes down to uh, like three main goals is what I kind of look at. I think the first the first key of, of your product offering is making it easy for the customer to make a decision. Uh, it's easy to, there's stores with one product, stores with a hundred products, stores with thousands of products. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about offering the user a way to figure out what the solution to the problem is within your product offering. So um, there's a thing called choice paralysis that when you have a lot of products and if their solutions are very similar, it becomes difficult for the customer to understand or the potential customer to understand what one they need to solve their problem. So uh, a lot of, a lot of stores solve this with bundling um, where they offer, you know, the, uh, a bundle of products together that they, they group some products that are very similar or help you achieve a specific path or trajectory for your store. And they bundle those together so that you don't have to pick and choose which one you want. You just pay one flat fee and you get all of them. Um, bundles are probably the easiest way to, to kind of reduce choice paralysis. It also makes it so you can have a great pricing page because you just list your bundles. Um, instead of listing all the products, you can list the bundles and, and give a really clear pricing strategy. Um, a complex offering you know, can really result in, in higher refund rates too. If you don't offer bundles, but have a thousand products, um, you know, users can get confused or might not realize that the product they really needed was product B instead of product A, um, which usually results in a request for a refund and then they might repurchase. And that's just a hassle for the customers. So, you know, we solved this problem uh, with EDD by creating our passes. You know, we realized that people were um, signing up for our, our personal pass, for example, has all of our e-commerce integrations. Uh, when you group all the e-commerce integrate, or sorry, uh, uh, email uh, marketing integrations, not e-commerce integrations, email marketing integrations. Um, when you group all those together, you know, someone starting out may not, they might start with MailChimp or Active Campaign or something, get a year or, or six months into using the product and go like, you know what, my free trial ran up, the price is just too high. I want to switch over to the other service. And instead of having to go buy another add-on that they've already paid for another one, they can just download that one, set it up and disable the other one. Um, so by grouping those things, it allows customers to not really be locked into a specific integration category. Um, we do this also with our, our, our extended pass with the gateways. Our extended pass offers all of our gateways. Um, so if Stripe's working great, uh, or our uh, authorized .NET's working great, and then all of a sudden you wanna switch over to Stripe because there's a cool feature over on Stripe, you can just install the Stripe add-on and you don't have to like go buy another add-on. So um, finding ways to really make their path forward that is less um, about repurchasing because we don't want to make them have to repurchase. And I guess the last one is uh, we don't want to hinder uh, our growth by racing to the bottom on price. I think that is one of the, the most challenging things to uh to teach a new store owner or a new business uh, owner or, or anyone creating a product, you know, it's really easy to undervalue our time. Um, you know, you may look at a, a, your competition who's creating thousands of, we'll, we'll say PDF documents and, and, and printables and selling them for a dollar 25. Um, it's really easy to say like, well, they're selling a dollar 25 and they're selling thousands. And I see they have, you know, a hundred thousand sales on Etsy it's really easy to say, well, then that's the price point I should be at is $1.25. Um, but what people don't realize is that by doing that, you're really undercutting your growth. Um, if you don't take into account your time, you know, it's easy to say, okay, well, I have to pay all these fees for, I have to pay for my licenses for EDD. I have to pay for my MailChimp. I have to pay for my hosting. I have to pay for my, um, I have to pay for my domain name. Those are my costs. It's really easy to go that far. But if you price too low, and this is something that I, I think we've learned over time, is that if you price too low, um, the first support ticket, the first customer support request that comes in could negate any profit you made off the initial purchase. Now, if you're not charging enough for your product, if your product is, is not, you know, build in the fact that you might have to talk to this customer once. Because talking to the customer once, taking an hour of your time could negate any profit you made off the product. So really focusing on your paying attention to your soft costs and understanding that 
those are uh, profit eaters really quickly. Um, and then once it's okay to experiment with pricing, you know, raise prices a little bit, lower prices a little bit, um, find that point where you're uh, optimizing conversions. And, you know, it's a price point customers will pay for your product. And again, if we focus on tip number one, just focus on the product, your product should solve a problem. Your conversions won't be that hard to come by. But then you also have to make sure you pay attention to the profitability of that price point that you're picking and make sure that you're you're not finding that you're spending too much time dealing with customer interaction or or updating documentation that uh, one sale is negated by fixing something. Final question. What what overall advice would you give businesses who are just starting out and selling digital products? You know, these days I feel like there's there's not like any new ideas out there. Uh, you know, when we create something nowadays, there's probably a, there's some out there. I'm probably being short-sighted, but a lot of times when we create something, uh, it's because a current solution is not solving a problem for us. So uh, at some point we look at how much work we'd have to do to make that one thing kind of work for us. And we decide, you know what, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to create a product myself that can solve a problem for customers. Uh, I would say, really controlling your own roadmap and future is is the key um if you it's really easy to take a look at all the people you're competing against looking at what they're doing and trying to replicate that for your business and the problem is if you continue to focus on what they're working on and the features they're building or the products they're building the ways they're updating their website to do to, to do the marketing funnels you aren't paying attention to your product. You're paying attention to theirs and then you are deciding what features or what changes they're making that you want to do, which is not controlling, that you're letting them control your roadmap. So if you focus on the problems that your customers are saying or trying to solve, saying they're having or trying to solve, then build your entire you know, product line and release structure website around solving their problems instead of moving problems from one product to another product. Um, you control your uh, your roadmap, which leads you to be um, more focused on your customers, not how to gain other people's customers. It lets you um, kind of really stand out in the market because you're a solution that is customer focused, not market focused. We'll have all the links that we talked about in the show notes and the description below. If you're on YouTube, let us know in the comments below which one was your favorite tip on getting started. And hopefully he's agreed to come back and chat a little bit more about some of the other tips, go a little bit deeper into those. But if you want to get started with your own website, then watch this video next as I walk you through step by step on how to set up your own website using WordPress. And I'll see you over there.